All right. We're off. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Group Therapy for Old Timers. Uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about how seniors think about career progression. To give a very brief intro, um, I started thinking about this a few years ago at Warner Brothers as the uh, senior manager there. Uh, and I was having a little, I don't know how to describe it, maybe discontent around how far I was getting from the games I was working on. And I was really wrestling with what does this mean for my career and how am I going to, how do I move forward and how do I progress? And uh, really what I was hoping to do was to sit down with a bunch of my favorite esteemed colleagues and peers at the Irish Bank at GDC. Um, that became impossible. And so now you'll see a bunch of them here in this talk. Uh, the, you know, my favorite people to sit down and, and discuss games user research with and, and what we're working on. And uh, so we pivoted to online, and so did the conversation. And so that's where we are now. Um, just to start, because uh, they will all introduce themselves shortly, but to give you just a sense of the, uh, the strength of this panel, I'd love for everybody to just punch in broadly how many years experience you have working in games user research. And so people can get, a, get an idea of just the level of sort of expertise and, and knowledge and experience that uh, you're all bringing to the table today. Is it working? Well, I, I can click on something, but uh, is there, I don't see a button to submit. <laughs> just, yeah, I, 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 I click on the response and, and that's it. Oh, hello, there we go. All right. So, you know, I think just right away off the bat here, we can see clearly that, uh, you know, this is a, a panel assembled of, of people with a lot of experience, a lot of um, thoughts on the topic of games user research and, and a lot of time put against it. And now I will ask you each to just quickly jot in an introductory message, say who you are, where you're at, uh, anything else you deem pertinent, and we can go from there. And I will sincerely hope that it works this time. Um, to introduce myself, because I won't be typing throughout this, but my name is Jonathan Dankoff. I was uh, at Ubisoft for a quick decade, then I went to Warner Brothers, uh, did a very quick stint at Stadia, and uh, I'm happy to announce that I'll be joining Haven Studios uh, by the time this video is live. So it's a, it's a secret for everyone in this room, but it, it won't be a secret much longer once this is live. What? There we go. So we got Kirk working at EA. Oh, an Oscar-winning studio. I watched that short. It was wonderful. It's awesome. It's very exciting. Has everybody else entered anything? Why isn't it going? Oh, my big time, man. No, it's supposed to be instant. It takes time to type things in. Oh, typing the takes time. It's a little hinkier than in the. Yeah, it does take time to appear because I did submit my answer like maybe a minute ago. Aha, uh -huh, there we go. They're starting to come in. So, welcome, there Veronica, uh, research director from EA, currently a consultant. Uh, John, who's at Gearbox. Ian at Blizzard, previously worked with me at, at UB. Oh, I should um, have put my name. Sorry. <laughs> uh, it's okay. I'll, I'll say who you are. Um, we got Celia here, Nick Sweeney, who's currently at Behavior. We got Tom from Xbox, Seb from Player Research, Nana, who's at PlayStation, and Mr. John Hobson, Phil, doctor. who's at Activision, doctor. doctor, sorry, doctor, oof, off to a rough start. And that's, that's all of us. Um, you know, I think hopefully it will take a second to do these introductions, but I feel like most of us are pretty well known. Uh, a good degree of renown in this group. And then the last little softball question is, what cocktail did you bring with you? You know, in the spirit of recreating the Irish bank, a good table, hanging around, chatting about games user research, I brought a, a Boulevardier with me, uh, a nice little beverage. What did you all break for yourselves? Water, mocktails also were... were, were um, it's 2 p.m. and I'm an old timer, that's fair. Water, some good coffee. Yeah, I'm going to just take a pause for a little bit, sip here. Question, All right. are we supposed to be seeing things to vote on? Or 
in a second. In okay. the next ones, we'll start to we'll start cool. to, to do that. I'm, I'm... All right. Anybody uh, have anything? Want to tell a story why they chose their beverage? John, you look like you have a fancy scotch. So. <clears throat> This is this is the uh, Lagavulin 16 year distillers edition. Uh, this this was a uh, surprise gift actually uh, from some friends in graduate school. Uh, one of the nice parts about uh, COVID and working from home is that it actually uh, brought some folks together who normally wouldn't necessarily see each other because we're all remote and starting to use and learning to use uh, things like Discord uh, a little more frequently. Uh, so I was able to reconnect with some friends from grad school and start uh, start gaming with them. And uh, one Saturday night, a couple months back, my doorbell rang at 9.30 p.m. while we were in the middle of a gaming session. And I was like, what the hell's going on? So I answered the door and uh, Drizzly, the uh, beverage delivery service, had brought me this. And I asked my gaming group, uh, do you folks know anything about this? And they all like, yeah. So it was a wonderful gift from them. So I figured I'd, I'd bust that out for uh, this gathering today. Well, that is very nice of them. I wish somebody would send me a bottle of Lagavulin. <laughs> all right. Moving on to the real stuff now. Um, one of the first questions that came up when I was started, you know, thinking about this two years ago, was, um, you know, Mortal Kombat had just shipped, and my name is in the credits. And normally, as a researcher in the past, like that's a big thing that you would celebrate a milestone, right, of shipping a game. Uh, but I had never even loaded. Uh, I hadn't loaded a build, right? A researcher on my team was the one who took care of it entirely on their own, and that was their credit and their milestone. And I started wondering here, how is it, you know, what um, what do we consider really, like whether it's a, in a quarter or a year or several years, what are the milestones or the achievements that uh, you consider important or valuable in your career uh, that, that make a difference to you or make you proud? Like if you could, you know, stick it to your fridge, what would it be? So the first answer we've got is reports uh, shipping the game. And getting called out by studio leadership, so that's I think one that's that feels great, right? When when you get a call out from leadership after the game goes out internally, they're rarely external. Though when they are external, that's even better. That having studio leadership call out the the role that UXR played. Uh, anyone else want to speak to that one? Well, that, that wasn't mine, but I, I do love it because I think as leaders, we're often setting people up for those kind of things, you know, or help publicizing their work or making sure the channels are open. So uh, very often they are getting called out because we've helped not only develop them as people, but also develop the pipeline so the senior leadership hears about it and understands it and know, knows why it's important uh, and knows how to attribute it back to our team. The occasional shout out we get from game teams publicly is also really, really nice. Like uh, the JFO team uh, had UXR heavily, heavily uh, featured in their documentary. Um, and it was clear that it was valuable to them. So that kind of thing is really important. We actually just ran a play test for a project in development right now and the, uh, the development studio that's working on it uh, gave some, some pretty big kudos to the user research group uh for kind of helping with their their first time user experience tutorial and it showed um the, a lot of great changes went in so that was really really positive it's interesting a lot of focus on sort of both internal and external recognition which certainly external is in my career at least or in my time has been quite rare right it's, it's not every day that um, that gets it out in the press um i see a bunch of people mentioning career pivots throughout the career uh, I'd be curious to hear more about that. I enter that one. I think that you no, know, as you go throughout your career, there have been changes. Like, uh, you know, even for myself, like, oh, I was a clinical psychologist, and then oh, researcher, and then continue on the professional uh, path. You know, manager, director, and consultant now. And I think that those are the things that are those major milestones on, you know, when you reflect back and you are in certain forks in your life. And those are the things that you make a conscious decision to where you want to go next. Uh, and that happens, you know, to yourself, but also to your peers and, and your people. And I think that those are the uh, key aspects or those key milestones that uh, really helps to, to keep growing and to keep enjoying and looking back and, you can see those those moments.
thank you. I'm, I'm seeing the, the, um, I'm getting a sense from a lot of these that like they are um, not milestones in the sense of like here's a thing that's done, but there's a lot of stuff that, like the satisfaction of just a, a continuous evolution and growth, right? Like there's you know watching team members grow, watching them get promoted, watching them, um, watching the you know the actual size of the team grow that are, are less uh, like moments in time and more just sort of progressive markers of a successful research organization. I don't know if, if anybody else has thoughts on that and how they how they sort of tie themselves to that progression. Bueller. <laughs> All right. Well, there we go. Um, to, to help you out on this one, uh, John. Yes. Johnny, um, for me, you know, I, my career path has been going towards uh, more like general man management, and the my focus now is yes, I, I you know, I'm always uh, passionate about user research and data analytics, but really, it's is my team engaged? Do they think they have an impact? Uh, do they enjoy what they're doing? Um, I have a team right now that's a good size, but skews more junior. And so they're they're having their first experience of really having an impact on you know the production teams. And that's that's where I tend to uh, to focus myself and ask my leads to focus on is is what's happening to your uh, team members and how do they uh, get that experience that they don't necessarily have right now. Um, so that's that's why I, I was the one that wrote. Uh, people accomplishing something that impacts the game. Mm -hmm. That's really the focus. And that's that's how I think I get uh, better results for keeping people engaged and uh, happy. That's great. Yeah. It's certainly a sort of a, a pivot from early days career, right? Where it's like, I finished a report. And now it's like, nope. That's, you know, the, the, the scale yeah. is completely different and changed from where you started. And you were talking about credit survey. For me, it's seeing now the people, you know, they're at their first time in the credits, and that's mm -hmm. what makes me happy. My, my name, I've, you know, I've seen it a few times. It's fine. <laughs> I've been in a couple of those lists, but now yeah, exactly somebody getting their name the first time in, a, in the list, and you know, sharing on social media the picture that they took on the credit is a great feeling of uh, yeah. pride for them. Exactly. I mean, I still take pictures of the credits, but I'm really excited when I see myself. But it's also everyone else. It's like. I think that that feeling has never really gone away yet, but hopefully, uh, yeah. But it's more more than just about me now. It's interesting here. Former directs running their own teams, so that's like sort of passing it on to pass it on to pass it on, and, and sort of a matryoshka of of GER leadership. That's a nice thing to see. All right. Any anybody else want to add anything live to? Uh, to stuff that, you know, milestones that, that really they're happy to see? Anything to discuss? No? All right. Now, you know, th this question here is around um, none of us are where we started, right? Every one of us has seen the significant career growth and, and, and changes, as, as Nick just discussed, right, where he started in one place. Now he's, he's working differently. Uh, I'm curious, in another 10 years, how do we see uh, our own roles evolving, right? Um, for any of us who've been here 10 to 15 years, this discipline's only about 10 to 15 years old in games, which means that we've been you know, building the ladder as we climb it. Uh, and so where do you see yourselves? So you know, either going further into management, further into principle or craft, uh, going out as a consultant, or if you're already consultant, staying there and, and building that. Um, I know some folks talk about changing discipline within games uh, or even leading games entirely. Some might just be happy where they are, right? Uh, and then uh, some might be getting close to retirement. So, you know, it's, it's a possibility or something else entirely. How do you see your own sort of evolution moving forward here? Wow, deeper into management seems to be by far the, and so I guess I'd be very curious to see somebody uh, who's like deeply, deeply into management now. Um, you know, how has that how has that affected your relationship to the discipline of games user research since you're not 
really practicing games user research on, on titles. Uh, how do you think about that? How do you how do you uh, sort of reconcile? And that was one of, to be totally honest, one of the issues that I was thinking about, right, is that I like making games and going further into management was difficult for me to, to wrap my head around because it meant getting further from production and closer to a, sort of a central identity. Well, I can I can jump in and say one of the things that makes it easy for me is I do think I'm practicing user research, so I totally get the sentiment around your statement. Um, but that's never bothered me being in a management position, a leader position. I mean, I think you know lead developers who manage twenty people think they are doing development on a project or on a platform. So um, that's what keeps me going. If I didn't think I was doing it, then you're absolutely right. I'd be I'd be out. So uh, yeah, I think we're, I think we're all doing it for sure. This is a this is a super tough question. Decades a long time, and uh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how I would answer this. I mean, probably today, deeper into management, but five years from now, uh, it might be, you know, doing more principal work or something else. It's 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 hard to know, I suppose. Uh, I think for me personally, it's always been about learning. Um, as long as I feel like there's something that I'm learning that's new and interesting, then I'm happy to kind of chase it. Uh, and right now, that's you know management and everything. So, when I uh, joined Gearbox uh, about eight and a half years ago, this is my first job in games. I think it was that one data point that was the five to ten years uh, in the industry. So it's been the only place I, I've worked in games, and uh, I joined as as the manager of, of a very small team. And we're still consider we're still small by comparison, um, but in looking at what the next couple of years are bringing we're going to be expanding not just the number of people we're doing, but uh, the additional lanes that we're bringing on, uh, kind of delving into market research, bringing that under our umbrella and uh, more delving more into analytics. And so, you know, I, I, I selected deeper into management because I, I think as I get farther removed from the day to day, as we bring on more people and more disciplines, it, it's going to feel a bit more centralized. Uh, but I don't know, that's kind of exciting for me. Um, you know, after after eight plus years, I'm, I'm eager to kind of look at the not just what's happening next month in the lab, but what's happening next year. Uh, I'm focusing more on kind of the, the direction standpoint. It's interesting to me that uh, nobody's like, no, this is fine. I can do this for 10 years. That like everybody sees some sort of path forward for themselves that isn't uh, staying where they are, which to me, I think, you know, is interesting that, that at least I'm not aware of um, any uh, like CXO roles at game studios or VP of UX. And that's something that I, that I would expect, you know, for people continuing down the path another decade. If you're already a director today, um, continuing down the path will mean creating new titles and new roles for people because there's no way, you know, if you want to go deeper into something, I imagine you would expect that to be reflected in title and, and authority. I mean, to speak to that, like, I'm a director now. I would be really surprised if I had a title higher than director in the next 10 years. Um, I'm not interested in being a VP. I'm not interested in migrating out of games to places where there is a VP of user research. There's realistically not a much of a pat, uh, ceiling above unless I do something very non-standard. So I would expect that my progress to be more horizontal than vertical at this point. Is that something that bums you out or you're fine with that? I mean, it would be nice, but there's nothing wrong with sort of new game plus instead of uh, continuing on the current road. I'm and sad that one person chose leaving. That makes me, that's sad. It bums me out. That's, whoever it is from here that's considering leaving, that's, that'll be a brain drain on our industry. No, I, so I put that because I actually enjoy moving around. I started in games and I bounce around a little bit and then I come back. So I, I and my boss knows this, my team knows this. And because 10 years is a long time. So if it was next year, I wouldn't say it. But, um, you know, I think that is how, for me, that's how I go get new challenges, different challenges, learning about the space. So I'm kind of with John. I don't see too much more of a ceiling uh, for me personally, or sorry, I don't see too much past the ceiling for me personally, but to go do something in a different industry would be a lot of fun. I've, I've done that before. So I figured be honest, you know, I love games. I think games is a great place to work, but 10 years is a long time. You're not planning to challenge Randy to single combat for rulership of uh, Microsoft Curve? No, no, I would challenge him if he made me do it, then I'd have to fight him to not do it. So he's doing a great job. <laughs>
I, I'm sorry to join late, everybody. Um, but um, talking about like career advancement or like doing beyond director level, obviously I've been doing that for a bit now. So it's definitely possible if you want to. Uh, it just depends if that's what you want. Um, so I was thinking about John, what John said. It's like, yeah, you can't probably be a VP of user research, but you can be a VP of experience or user experience. And it might be, and then you would just roll under you directors and things like that. So um, if that's your career mode, if you want to have an, a you know, 150 person org or whatever in a big company, that, that definitely seems like a possibility. There was for me something interesting here, uh, like uh, a lot of UX directors in game studios, I find, have a design background and not a research background. I'm curious if anybody has thoughts on, you know, is that correct? Are we happy with that? Is that is, do we want to see more? Uh, UXRs taking up the UX director mantle, or are we happy with UXD sort of owning that? Or is, does anybody have thoughts there? I, oh, sorry, go ahead, Veronica. I just see it here. Uh, I, I, I muted it myself, but uh, I I do agree with you that there is a, the trend is that the designers, the people coming from the designer background are the ones taking those more like uh, director and above. Uh, spaces and um, you know, obviously that would need to should change and i think that there is opportunities for um people coming from that research background to to take and stand on the broader discipline i think you know there's uh, outside the game industry uh the the head of ux at shopify she came her whole career coming from the research perspective um at the same time, I think that to give the people with the design background credit, they have a more a more breadth of the multiple aspects of UX. And even though they don't have that specialty that the GER people have in, in the depth of research, they dab more on that. What I think that research to really get to that spot, we need to increase the, the breadth of the researchers and be more familiar with the skills and processes that goes in design. Obviously, we work with them closely, but I think that looking a bit more under the hood might really help to be more of that equal and to actually you know, bring that uh, perspective of the fuller discipline. And I think that uh, it's, it's doable. It's um, moving into that direction, and it just needs for us that we have enjoyed for many, many years that very depth specialization uh, that we have enjoyed and view a little bit more of a, the T shape uh, for UX and get there. It's interesting because um, companies with a lot more money and more maturity when it comes to UX, and I think a lot of my mobile clients and things like that, um, they might have a designer in charge and they might technically be the top of the org, but they are definitely not making any moves forward without user research. And so, you know, can you have co-directors? Does that make sense? And ideally, you would just have the best team builder in that position, right? If you're talking a director there, you want someone who can run a team and they understand all of the different roles. I don't know how many different UX roles there are, but it's certainly not just designer and researcher, right? Um, and I wonder if there's something about UXRs that are just like, you know, maybe we're just like nerdy scientists type who don't want to take on, you know, a leadership role. But I find I look at the group here and I find that hard to believe, right? Like, I think we're all reasonably career minded folk, at least from what I know, some of you and not all of you. Um, so I wonder if that's just a track that maybe, you know, either we don't consider or we're not groomed for. Um, so that might be something there, too. I've also seen like some companies instead of being like a, a UX director, it ends up they end up collecting their insights functions like analytics, data science, uh, UX research, marketing insights into one insights org. And a researcher from any of those can come can can lead those in my in my experience. So that's another path. Yeah, I mean, I feel like with with games, it, it's really important to understand the the complexity of game development and all of the different people within games. And so, coming from a, 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 a an academic background, a peer user research background, often you don't have the context. And so, sometimes I think that limits um, the path upwards. Um, 
And so, you know, I think a lot of the work that we do is exposing our our researchers to that. Um, the game teams, they're understanding what it means to work at the speed of development, understanding what's necessary for the business. You know, we've watched um, within Sony, our, our analytics team and our, our business intelligence team, and they really excel when they understand the business. And I think that same holds for user research. The more you understand the business, and that really comes with experience. Um, I've seen some really successful researchers who have stepped outside of research, tried their hand at, at game design, tried their hand at production and have come back. And those those insights and those experiences are super valuable for being able to apply um, research effectively. And I think that that is really important in um, you know your path upwards, that you continue to have impact, that you know how to strategically apply research in a way that matters to that business. Yeah. That's why I had to leave Microsoft because I wanted to learn how to make games. Um, so I was there for two years doing user research and I found out that actually my true skill is getting a bunch of people together uh, and, and making games awesome. Um, and we could have someone else do the research. And so I left Microsoft to join another team so I could be a producer, systems designer, um, all those sorts of things. And obviously evangelize user research too. I mean, that's why the team plucked me out as well. They knew I was good at, at the UX user research side. So that maybe in smaller, like in smaller teams, you can probably do both. And that's the interesting career path. Um, I did a talk with someone a few weeks ago and, you know, she started at a small company as the sort of UA, the 2D UI artist, but she's like, I'm a UXer. Like, you know, there's a lot more we could do here. And then she just, you know, through sweat and, you know, pushing, she, she sort of started to cover more of those roles. And like an organization like Microsoft, they didn't understand like, how do you even move someone from user research to production? Like, it, it, it didn't even make sense. Like, it, there was no sideways move possible, really. So, um, so maybe you're losing out on retaining talent or finding talent in one area that might actually be more valuable in another area. And so, you know, what kind of companies are flexible and offer those opportunities? Maybe that's something important to consider. Should we be advocating for like shadowing programs within within the studio? I mean, as as leaders in, in user research. Should we be advocating with other leaders to to have our researchers, you know, shadow for an extended period of time folks in game design and production to learn those skills in that context? There's no downside yeah. other than they might discover that they're not great at it, but like that's <laughs> fine to discover too, right? Like that's that also gives them a sense of whether they want to do it and are any good at it too, right? Yeah, I, I was gonna uh, bring up a, a similar point, but more more along the lines of like, do we talk to our people? like about their very long-term goals and tell them that if you are a 10 plus year veteran as a UXer, UX researcher, it might be more difficult to get into those broader leadership. Like maybe maybe they want to be a studio GM someday. You, that person may not want to stay in UX for 10, in UX research for 10 years. They, may, they will probably want to do other things and transfer before it gets, before they're, they're too senior to make that transfer really possible. Because like um, I've seen at least at EA, I've seen people that would that if they want to transfer, they have to keep, take a couple of steps down, in order to to uh, mm -hmm. and like that affects compensation, it affects all sorts of things. So. Mm -hmm. Let's move to this one because it does sound we're sort of getting close to this. I'm curious, you know, um, what is it? right now that, that sort of keeps you up at night regarding the future of the discipline. And I think we're touching on this of like, where, where do our talent go? How do we, how do we uh, source talent? You know, there's, there's a lot of stuff in here of like, what are the, what are the difficulties that we're having now as a discipline that uh, we need to be thinking about and uh, really, you know, considering as we try to grow, as we try to expand, um, you know, I, I know uh, there there are lots of things that you know seat at the table. How are we sourcing juniors? Are we preparing people? How do we graduate people from you know early career to mid to senior? How do we keep our talent on board? How do we uh, how do we you know find the right people? Um, these are things that at least I know were keeping me up at night previously. And so I'm curious uh, for y'all, what is it that you're thinking about? How are you considering it? How are you uh, tackling these questions. Ethics and inclusion is a good one. Uh, I'd love to hear more for whoever wrote that one. 
Yeah, that that was me. <laughs> we can talk about it. Please. I mean, I know like oh, ethics now? review boards are a thing <laughs> in every other research discipline on the planet. And I'd never even heard of one until like 13 years in where somebody was like, oh, ethics review board. And I was like, uh, what? Like, we, we never had those at UB. Yeah, no, I know, uh, but but that's the thing. Uh, we're here to to fight for the user, and and means also making sure that the games are into their best interest. So, any uh, monetization is gonna put some sort of pressure to the player, and we need to make sure it's a win-win situation. So, yes, the game has to be um, has to make revenue. People need to to live out of their. Uh, art definitely but we also need to define where's the limit and when too much is too much uh and inclusion so we need to make sure games are inclusive uh so uh it's amazing to see all the the great job that user researchers did to advocate for accessibility for example but we still have so much uh, more to do um that's what made the game in inclusive too to uh to everyone and our discipline more inclusive i think we among all the, the the folks in the game industry, uh, the UX folks are the, probably some of the most inclusive. Um, but the game industry overall is really not inclusive. So I think we have a role to play here. Thank you for sharing that. When will we be replaced by AI and machine learning is an interesting one. That's me. I think very, I think a lot about um, a lot of our stereotypes that as Americans we have and Europeans as well about, you know, how certain creative craft disciplines or certain disciplines, you know, you can only find in North America or Europe. And um, that's not true. And that's going to change dramatically. And so if people here are sitting on their laurels thinking like right now it's impossible to find great UX designers, but that's going to be in three or four years, there's going to be a whole pool of amazing people from countries that are totally underrepresented there. Um, and so that's something that keeps me up at night, not the machine learning and AI, you know, okay a bit, but it's really just the like, you know, we, we are all like really sought after right now, but what happens when, you know, demand outstrips supply or supply outstrips demand. Right. I'm looking at the commodification of GER and also the uh, centralization of resources at the top studios. And those seem to come together as sort of like people are just grabbing everybody. Is that, is that correct? Who put those in? Can you speak to those a little? So commodification was me. Um, that wasn't what I meant. So you're, you're grouping them in a way that may not be the way I intended. It may be right. But, um, but just the idea that sort of like we have settled into a little bit of a rut that like, this is a, what a game usability study looks like. Execute one of those, execute one play test, execute one whatever. And the idea that this is sort of a understood, stamp them out by the numbers sort of profession. Um, yes, when we sort of started doing this, we had to set up standards, but we were doing that. We, we understood that we were essentially carving temporary uh, structure out of chaos. And I'm slightly worried that people after, who are coming after us think these are these methods and ways of thinking about things are sort of handed down from on high. When yeah, I agree. As strong as anybody else. Well, even worse yeah. is that if you actually are competing in that game as you get to be senior, you're not going to make the money. Like it's just it's a race to the bottom in terms of wages. Like you're. You're you're not going to get the pay that you want. like. If you want to make money in the industry, you can't be running tests. Like, if they're especially if they're seen as a commodity, which they mostly are these days, it seems like. So that was definitely not a business I wanted to be in for sure. Um, and so, how do you fight that? Uh, I work on the business side of things now. Like, I work with studios who who make games and who have budgets to do it, and I find commodities when it comes to re actually that's only partially true i'm going to build out our research org as well which you know, won't, but it'll be partially commodified right it'll partially they'll be the people in that org will will most likely be limited in their growth um because i don't know where i mean unless they decide to become super entrepreneurial and like decide to run it like a business with its own like silo of and that would be cool like i don't mind that happening but um, but strategically for me and my company, our differentiator is user research. 
not a profit center necessarily, but maybe I'll change my mind at some point. You know, I think I still think there's a there is room for commodification of user research. You know, the play test that stamped bit. You know, not all teams understand how to use user research. I mean, I think that there's a there's there's a spectrum of of understanding of what is research, how do you use research, and what is uh, UX as opposed to UR. And so, you know, some teams that you're starting off, they're starting off, they're starting to understand what this is. I actually think that just simple play tests, you know, simple reports, easy to digest. There, that's a that's a decent on ramp, honestly. Um, and I think that it, it's a great training ground for junior people that come in. There's a lot to how do you communicate? You know, I always think of user research, success of user research in, in three areas as, as skill craft and influence. You know, we hire these bright people and it's all about the skills that we bring in. And then influence is learning for them learning how to speak, how to understand, how to listen, how to engage, how to interpret. And then, you know, the craft is really an intersection of all of those things, understanding the problem, applying your skills to that, being able to um, synthesize that data and present it back in a way that's meaningful. So, you know, I think that that's not a bad training ground as, as we have our juniors. And, and when we come to try to move these more, these bigger teams away from, you know, a, a standard play test, um, that just requires more skill and and more influence and and more coercion if you will or you know impact showing impact so um i think there i don't think there's anything wrong with that to be honest i think what we do is is a pretty wide spectrum and the exciting part and kind of what keeps what 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 we think about is you know how do we continue to make impact how do we go deeper we don't want to give up what we've already the successes we've already had but we want to take it further and so I think that's one of the things that we think about um, that really is an interesting problem to stay up and think about. I had a slightly related point for that one, that commodity, but I was taking it to uh, research at scale and then particularly about democratization of UX research. Uh, that keeps me out at night in a positive way in the sense of how do we get there? How do we come, how we can we democratize UX research to really be able to help a whole team or a whole company to actually get uh, information and insights back in a way that they can actually work with it. And for UXR to not be as gaty in terms of, you know, who does the research or, you know, you don't know how to do this or, the, they will just cherry pick interpretation and you know besides that, that being a risk but how can we help these other partners and the rest of the whole uh, development uh, industry to be able to do some of that and i hope that we can really get to that one point that day and maybe we need to commodify some pieces and then share them with them that's a really good point that Nana and Veronica have made there. Like, I think the the thing that worries me is that I'm like, game designers often don't know what they don't know about user research. And that is not something that's changed much in the last 10 years. It's changed in pockets. Specific studios will have pockets of competence here. But like when a new designer comes into a team, I I, I keep having to have the same sort of like, educational struggle with them that and uh, um, and as they under, sort of understand how UX research can fit into their process and the, so it's but the education is all retail there's no like whole there's no wholesale understanding within in the industry of how to use this these data in uh, to improve games it was my point on the uh not siloing games user research capabilities inside the larger studios. And I think it extends all of these points, really. I'm sure we've all, one imagines that we've all seen the power of games user researchers, particularly in smaller projects and those, uh, you know, really creative teams, the power of just a, a few uh, user research interventions to really help those teams out. And so, you know, I would regret a future that uh, doesn't serve those smaller teams. And, and to Veronica's point, trying to find ways to democratize or uh, increase maturity across teams of all sizes is really valuable. And I, I fully agree with Nana's point about uh, 
the value of productizing these services, whilst yes, uh, John, that there is a danger that they become uh, rote and and um, you know like fast food approaches to to user research. They're, they're they're friendly and not too scary for these teams that are just experimenting with the first types of user research that are ever run to to run a user test or or a, an expert analysis or something like that. It, it, you know, it's an approachable and, and not so scary way for them to get involved uh, and feel the power that, that the discipline can provide them. So yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of the democratization as well. I mean, I've definitely had clients this time around when I did the user research uh, consulting years ago. I was obviously just doing user research for big companies, but I would do UX for folks and I would just train, I would train their junior producers and people who are interested to be moderators. And then I would remotely view the test and give them feedback both on what they saw and on their moderators and how to improve the jobs, which in general means just shut up. Um, and like that was super effective. It worked for a lower budget game. It introduced and got the team excited. Uh, I left then at some point and who knows whether they kept on with best practices. Um, and then I've worked with other folks like from different countries, just trying to help them out on an advisor level. Uh, but how do you make that profitable, like that kind of model profitable? That's what I want to know because I would love to do more of that stuff. And but I, when I've got big clients that want me to do all sorts of stuff and pay all my people lots of money, it's like it's hard to find the time for that. And and so I'd love more democratization of the research, especially if we keep quality up and serve underserved game makers from parts of the world where the eco the economics just doesn't make sense. They can't hire an American consultant. They don't have the money to do that. This question, in all honesty, is a little cheeky. OK, I've set it up a little bit facetiously. And I'm curious, and this one is, is a, uh, it's a hot spot, so you can put your marker anywhere you want. But I'm curious, you know, what is most important to you as you think about how you're growing and how you're thinking about your own career? Is it growing your clout and your team and getting more and more importance in an organization? Is it uh, really focusing on creating the greatest product that you can make? And then this is the most silly one, but like, is it really more focused on building your own eminence, building your own brand, building yourself, uh, and creating something uh, important to you? And uh, wh where do you put yourself in this sort of phony triangle that I've made up in terms of um, power versus product versus person, I guess, is how I'll phrase it. Um, let's refresh this. OK, so not many people willing to fess up to being interested in getting rich. And I guess that's to be expected. But uh, yeah, I, I want to talk to the people who think that was the career, the career path of games user research was all about getting rich because talk about career advice. <laughs> First, yeah, I'm going to start with psychology, and then I'm going to go into games. And that's just going to money's going to fall from the sky. I feel what's outlined here, Johnny, is that you've, you've really done a three-step plan, right? It's top of triangle, <laughs> left, and then right. Yeah. First, to get the money, then get the power. Um, I put mine midway between the enormous research empire and Richard I trying because at my age, like the legacy part is important and it doesn't have to be an enormous empire, but I'd like it to be well thought of and respected amongst my peers. And um, this is a company that I formed myself. And so I would like to find retirement in it. Um, and so, you know, I don't need to be rich to retire um, and I don't need to be, you know, some megalith of a company but like and I, I bet you know by career and by you know I, I mean I, I don't know how other folks look at it. And, and I wouldn't want people to be discouraged that they couldn't do both just because they pursued a career early on in user research that would make me sad if if people felt like they couldn't attain that through some sort of valid path there are also like if, if you know we can tell junior people that, that if you want to if your focus is on money they're there are places to go that's pay more money for research than others. Um, and so usually it's the companies that also that do games in addition to a bunch of other stuff where they don't necessarily do the discount thing for gaming salaries that a lot of the game like gaming first companies do. So that's one option. On the subject of making the world's greatest game, I, I'm I'm coming to peace with the fact that um my my influence and my team's influence is always going to be limited, right? Where I think we all reach that point where we're like, man, 
we've done everything we can and uh we, we can't control other people we can we can uh, influence as much as possible but at the end of the day i want to be happy with the work that we've done uh independent i think uh from from how the game eventually is received it's always nice right when when the work you've done results in some really positive outcomes and that's reflected in you know everything from sales to user you know customer feedback at large um to metacritic scores less and less these days uh but you know do i want to make the world's greatest game i i've come to i've come to grips with the fact that you know probably not that that's less important for me How about make better games you did last year? Oh, hell yeah. That'd be great. Incremental steps, baby steps all the way. I agree. But we're talking about extremes, right? It, it's, uh, that's a bit, that's a big one. I mean, you know, Johnny said himself, it's a bit cheeky. You know, in some ways, like working with the world's most awesome development teams would be sort of more of mine than the, than the world's greatest video game. Cause you could be a cog in an 800 person machine um, or you can work with a small team and, you know, enjoy that kind of work or whatever. Um, so. Yeah, I think Jason and I are probably pretty similar on this triangle up there in the top right. I think I'm the one that's closest to building an enormous research empire, which I don't know if it's telling or not. Uh, but yeah, I'll echo Jason's points. For me, the most rewarding projects I've worked on have been the ones, not, not necessarily the biggest budget games, but the, the folks trying to push the sky. The most, the most interesting interaction designs, the most interesting, you know, novel, trying to push uh, different game genres and trying to push uh, games to new audiences. And then they're probably by definition not going to be the world's greatest game, but they're trying to solve interesting UX challenges. And so for me, that, that's the definition of the of the most interesting work uh, that, I, that I've done in my career. Um, yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, building an enormous, enormous research empire, dialing back to one of the answers I gave earlier, I find huge satisfaction in, sustaining building and sustaining this platform with player research for other people to do awesome research like i'm a bit i'm enabling masses of great user research to be done every day across the whole world um and, and that for me is super rewarding uh so yeah I, i've no i've no real desire to bottom left or bottom right Yeah, I think to Seb's point, I agree. Like one of the greatest motivations for me over the years, especially now kind of even where I'm at, is looking at developers try innovative things and try different things and really kind of helping to solve those puzzles. So I, I don't think, you know, it's not necessarily a, the benchmark of hitting a 90 rated game. It's seeing somebody try something new and, you know, being that support group to kind of help them, you know, re reach whatever design goals they've crafted. Right? I, I think that's the most rewarding thing we, we do. I think if you had put uh, work with the best people, um, that's what I, I probably would have done there. Sure, that's what everybody would have picked. Yeah. You know, well, I had to make I it mean, hard for you. <laughs> I suppose it sounds cliche, but I, I promise, I promise at least my, for myself, I'm sure everyone on here would say that working with the best people is probably the most satisfying piece. And at the same time, linking that to the diversity and inclusion people's first experience with this industry is often horrific and they aren't working with the best people so as a as a group you know i think we need to think hard about that because it'd be nice to at least have one welcoming place where people could go into the games industry and then also we have to shield them from all these other groups who you know can be pretty mean to everyone including user researchers if i remember tom can back me up and other folks can back me up there you had to deal with a lot of crap <laughs> from arrogant game designers and developers. Although I'm um, sure that there are some people, there's some like some game designer chat, right? Uh, at the similar level talking about like uh, arrogant researchers telling them how to make their game. Oh, hell yeah. The, the, the next one here is, uh, you know, looking again at, at the future of our, of our discipline is uh, we talked a little about you know what keeps us up at night, what what scares us, but like where do we need to be pushing, right? As as sort of a group, a, a subset of the leaders of the research discipline, what do we think we need to be uh, pushing on, developing, working hard at to to make the discipline grow, 
to move it forward, to give more space to the to the next people? Uh, how should we be thinking about um, the future of games user research and and where we can have a real impact uh, given you know the experience that we have? What do you mean by data can't show intent? Oh, so I put that one down. I mean, this this idea of, I think we're getting close and I don't have any good answers to this, but very often we are, um, we pride ourselves in the fact that like, yeah, you need user research. You can't just look at a bunch of telemetry data. You can't just look at a bunch of heat maps and see what people want to do and what they don't want to do. Um, but I'm hoping between AI and technology that we can get more into that so that we don't have to be standing there looking over your shoulder. We don't have to send you a survey. Uh, right now I've been, you know, I work with some groups that are, trying that we haven't hit it but it doesn't feel like science fiction it feels like something that we're going to say yeah remember when we kept saying that you know oh this data can't show you their intent that's why you need to use a research that's yeah yeah good thing we got over that um and i don't i'm not worried about it i think we need to go push and do more of that it's not my area of expertise but i i hope we can get there so we can really scale up in that way um, and work with some of these amazing design engineering, data science, analytics people right now to figure out how to go do that. And if not exact intent, then at least get us much closer. Um, I feel like it's a something we use to talk about us, but it's also kind of like a, a crutch or a hitch or a, or a gap that I think we can actually go and solve. I love Tom's the idea exactly of using right. Go ahead. No, I was just agreeing, saying Dom is exactly right. Yeah, I um, I spent many years uh, in a previous life looking at intentionality from behavioral data I, and the possibilities for for linking the two with with game behavior specifically um, is exciting, and I think we may be at a point where where that's possible. I've had some great conversations with some uh, analytics folks at, at publishing partners. And uh, they, they've got some really cool ideas for doing exactly that. Um, but I, I think you're right. I think this is the this is the time where we can start getting away from some of the self-reported data uh, and actually get to the heart of the matter while still retaining that idea of intentionality and and kind of intention of action. Uh, that just looking at at raw data from from telemetry is not going to give you. I love the one that's sort of bubbled up to the second place around uh, supporting disciplines that are overlooked, such as sound and narrative and, and other things. You know, we do tend to focus a lot on like UI and gameplay. Um, and so to me, that's something that, that really resonates of like, we need to start helping. You know, we have an audio director who loves to repeat that 50% uh, of the experience is in the sound and 0% uh, of the research is, right? And so, um, that's something that resonates with me pretty pretty strongly of like places that we need to start looking deeper in and collecting more information on. I don't know if anybody else has any other overlooked areas that they think we should be looking into and, and shining the UXR light on. Product management is often making decisions that could benefit from a user perspective. And uh, I found some good uh, good collaborations with uh, PM over Respawn and a couple of other places I've worked. The next one is on hiring, and I know that's sort of on a lot of people's minds. It's, a, it's something that takes a lot of senior cycles of figuring out where we're getting the next crop from. Um, anybody have thoughts on like how we can improve the the next generation, or or how? where we're finding these, these juniors and how we can prepare them for a life of, of games user research and industry? Uh, so that one's mine. Um, one of the things that I'd mentioned is for better hiring people with cross skills that we don't normally think about. So Kirk's example of like 0% of the research, I think it was Kirk, 0% uh, of the research is on sound. At one point at Bungie, we did studies on the, the music in the game because I happened to hire a user researcher who happened to be a musician, an amateur musician. And having those cross skills is the thing that lets you sort of leverage user research into new areas and to push boundaries. And that also goes back to the uh, diversity and inclusion aspect of if we want user research to be able to help a wider variety of people, we need to have a wider variety of people as user researchers. Yeah, that, that actually leads to a question like uh, um, that I have. Like, this is something I've, I've experimented with with my own hiring. 
but uh, inclu increasing diversity in our, our people also means increasing diversity in background. So does that mean like, um, do we consider people with like less education than we might or different education than we, we, we normally would? I, I obviously have a bias towards saying yes to that because I've hired some really good people that did not have advanced degrees. Um, but I would love to hear other people's thoughts. Um, at Behavior, quite a few people have been hired before there was any kind of uh, concerted effort to to build user research and analytics inside a company. And turns out that I have, uh, I think, three people that are from the biology field. And they think about some issues like community. Uh, they, they have some ways of approaching that or thinking about this that is totally different from anything else that I've seen uh, previously from other people. So, and the people hiring just, you know, they weren't looking for somebody who has uh, user research studies or experience or analytics. They were just, can we have somebody that can do the, you know, can get us started? So they, they kind of looked everywhere, find the people that were willing and, and onboarded them. So they didn't have that, you must come from that field or that kind of school to come in or have that kind of previous experience. So we're really open to anybody and um, admit that's kind of refreshing. Yeah, to actually you know, keep supporting that idea, I think that to really push those you know, new frontiers, it's about being a bit more humble and that uh, we don't have all the answers. We're not doing everything you know, perfectly. You think that will always be improved and and where are we looking for those responses? Maybe those people with different backgrounds. Uh, it could be about the partners and uh, really deepening our solutions, kind of what uh, Tom was suggesting to uh, you know, AI and modeling and, and looking at other ways of analyzing or getting insight from that. Uh, so I, I think it's about getting more curious ultimately and do looking around for other solutions and other ways to actually do it and and you will get inspired and you will find amazing proposals and be opening to to listen to those yeah i think one challenge i've experienced with this one in particular is obviously if you have a smaller team it's difficult to kind of hire for those other disciplines since really you're looking at the core is kind of the meat and potatoes you know standard usability kind of play testing um, so that's always where I've always been stressed is trying to find, can we move into those other disciplines if we only have two researchers or three, right? Um, th there are some challenges uh, around this idea. Um, so of course, I'm, I'm all for diversity and, and, and uh, opening uh, it up and, and be curious. Um, but I'm seeing a trend recently of, of un uh, some people forgetting that this is a science and you know, we're doing science and the scientific method is, is uh, here for a good reason. It's, it's for us to make sure we're not getting biased into the, the, the answers that we're getting or at least as we're trying to find answers. Um, and I, I remember uh, Ian Lewingston when he was uh, doing his uh, a talk at the Game UX Summit talking about good enough science is something that it's been resonating for me uh, quite a bit. Um, but we have to know, coming from academia, we have to uh, adjust to the pacing of, of the game industry for sure. Uh, but I'm a bit, uh, I'm seeing a lot today where we don't have not good enough science and we have a lot of uh, conclusion that are super hasty. I see a lot of people who don't um, master data analysis or just going to play around with the data and, and just going to, find some answers that fit what they need. And so I see a lot of uh, confirmation bias or self-fulfilling prof prophecy. Uh, so yeah, of course, we need to open it up to, to everyone and, and to get different perspectives, but we're doing science. So we also need to make sure that people understand that as soon as you manipulate data, as, as soon as you start a, in a, an experiment, and you can put biases in there and we have to be very careful in, 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 in this aspect. I mean, is, is the, is the middle ground there, you know, opening up, opening up positions and, and kind of extending our, our reach a little bit, but at the same time, providing that bootstrapping, that training in house, yes. right. 
not expecting somebody to come to the table with a master's degree or, or a doctorate um, in psych or sociology or, or, you know, analytics of any kind, but rather giving them that opportunity at the ground floor and then training them up in the scientific method, right? And, and, and showing them firsthand what good science is and what a good analysis is. Um, it's a challenge for sure, right? I mean, the, those of us who are in the leadership positions are often the ones with the advanced degrees and have the knowledge, but then we get pulled in all these different freaking directions, right? So how much time do we have to dedicate to, to training? Um, but I feel like that might be a good way to increase our diversity uh, and, and extend our reach a little bit for, for new hires while at the same time maintaining the good rigor that we want. And a PhD doesn't in the end defend you from some of those biases I've seen like truly excellent research conducted by people that, that don't have those. And uh, I've seen those same flaws that you brought up. Uh, uh, I don't have this. Yeah, regardless. It's a really good point. John, I'm waiting. Funny, you're, you're the most famous, what we do is not science person. Yeah, well, I've heard also, you say that a dozen oh, times. God, that that fire I, had a couple years ago. I'm waiting for, I'm, yeah, bring that back. Come on. I, I'm, I'm kind of of two minds. One mind is you can't train science at a, if they're not already interested in science by the time that they get their first job. So I'm skeptical of that, but I'm also like, I'm all about, I'm, I'm about science and scientific method informing things, but really it's all about the probative value. It's like, you know, for the research that you're going to do, um, what's the likelihood that it's going to move the needle and what's the likelihood that like there's go it's going to move the needle by mistake in a direction just due to some sort of bias or what have you. And so, uh, so I actually like, I don't think you can train science uh, at that level, uh, but I also think you've got to be careful is that like, you don't necessarily have to be a scientist to do great research. And I think it's worth noting, this is a really hard area to do science on. People are incredibly messy, games are incredibly messy, it's a permanently moving target. I mean, even we don't, we will never have the certainty, I think, of some of the other sciences. And that's fine. That if I wanted that, I would have gone into those fields. But I don't think we should, we should uh, suffer from physics envy either. I think a certain number of us who have worked at similar places may be familiar with the quest for the magic formula and the number above which we are guaranteed to have a successful game. And uh, the fact that, uh, I mean, all of us combined in this one panel, the amount of years that we've spent chasing the magic number, I think shows, unsuccessfully, shows that it doesn't exist. And that making games is harder than getting above uh, X point X. I got a brother who's got a PhD in physics, so I, I got the physics envy on, uh, on two sides here. <laughs> Also, there's there's other roles we played in org than, you know, like we help teams just having an outside eye that especially for seniors that we've we've seen it all and done it all before. Um, but also like not in terms of even like the overall game quality, but like allowing teams to take more risks, telling them which things that are the riskiest that we should front load and iterate on and stuff like that. Like, I, I think that like, again, we can like scientifically analyze all sorts of aspects of the game, but really focused on the making of the game, making feel. And one of the things that we can do too, is we can make people feel better and more confident in their games. Like all their hard work is paying off. Um, Cause as user researchers, we ask them to do like, in addition to their regular day job, <laughs> we ask them to spend nights, you know, actually polishing it and, and fixing, you know, UX and usability issues. And for them to see it pay off and stuff like that is, you know, it's pretty cool. If it's one thing the past year has actually uh, afforded us a gearbox is a, a greater appreciation amongst the developers for the user research process. Uh, you know, we've been working from home since last March and I've been working solely with developers as my participants. I'm sure many of you have as well. Uh, I've talked with other colleagues who are facing the same issue. So when we throw these developers into the participant role time and time again, because every month our, our pool shrinks a little bit, um, there, there's a greater appreciation for the rigor that goes into this. You know, when, when they sit there and they read an instructions document that, that goes through exactly what they need to do and why, because uh, we can be a bit more open with the devs than we would normally be. Uh, I think that helps quite a bit. 
but yeah, you're right. It, it's about it's about building that confidence and about and the, the opening doors for our colleagues. One um, was mine. The kind of sitting in the middle of this uh, this rank ordering, and that's kind of the idea that I had there. Was like user research can actually be in a position to to bolster everybody else moving forward, which is really great. All right. Um, some point we will all uh, have a term date. Uh, what does the next generation need to start thinking about before they cut us down and take our places? Um, I think, you know, very obviously looking at this predominantly white dude list over here, uh, we need to start thinking about how we start to graduate people to senior leadership out of uh, faces that don't look like this one. Um, but what else is out there? What else do we need to start thinking about for the next generation of, of research leadership uh, in the games industry? And what are the most important things that they should be thinking about um, as they prepare to, you know, it, graduating levels is always difficult, right? That's that step from a junior researcher to a mid-level, from mid-level to senior and from senior to management. Um, those are never easy transitions and they're often fraught with mistakes. I know my transitions were often work. Um, and so I'm curious, you know, if you have advice to uh, the folks coming up next who are going to be taking on the mantle, what do you think they should be thinking about and how should they be considering it? So here we have democratization again. I know that uh, probably this talk will appear after Tom and Ian, who are also here, will have argued about teaching developers how to run their own research. And I don't know, I have no advanced knowledge of who's taking which side, uh, but uh, I'm curious where you feel about democratization, either of you here uh, in this space um, for the future leaders. Oh, are you? <laughs> Me go? You go. You, you you start, and then I can I can okay. argue against it. I, I actually just I just got off uh, doing a whole talk about this for an internal Microsoft conference. So I would say that I am on the against side of democratization, but only in the forms of it that are siloed and that are like, hey, you go off and I'll teach you how to do usability and interviews, and then I'll you know I'll see you in six months. I think there's a lot of wrong ways to do it. There's a lot of risks to it. Um, there are other folks at Microsoft that have had a lot of experience and success doing it, and they are treating it as a team sport. They are treating it as bringing your your um, you know your teams along for the ride. Uh, so I see that, and I think okay, you know, if you can do it in that way, that's one thing. But I am I have a whole list, and we have a whole talk about it. Um, uh, that is, I just think there's things to, to worry about. It's very easy to do wrong, and and my I think the way I would sum it is, you have to really have the right motivation. If you think it's Let's get this stuff out of the way so we can go focus on different stuff. Then I think that's the wrong motivation. Well, I mean that's not that's not not my entire argument, Tom. Um, <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, I mean, you know, it, there'll be a whole talk. There'll be a whole. It's talk. true. Yeah, without without spoilers. I mean, is it spoilers? Did this did this happen? Is this happening? Your talk after that already happened in the future. Okay. Where this yeah. is happening okay. After it. Okay. So as I said in that presentation. My position is that I don't want to be doing usability studies and play tests 10 years from now. That sounds horrible. Uh, and in 20 years, if, if, um, if that's not just part of the design discipline and the design process, I feel like uh, we'll, have, we'll have definitely fallen behind. That's the, the short, short piece of my, my argument. And, and we expect you all to watch and you can all, I would love this group to tell us who won. So please. please do that. <laughs> but it really is it, like, I talk a lot about collaborative user research and, and being a, like a team approach and, and sure, maybe, you know, people aren't ready to jump into a moderator role or think about like specifically about strategy or goals for a specific test. But I know I've had a lot of great experience working with teams, just like, you know, they start out as moderators or they start in and, and then they just get better at it. They, Sure, they need someone doing quality control at the top, uh, but like that, like in the democratization piece, like that is actually a way to democratize it. It's so easy 
to video these so you can extreme everything and, and give them feedback all that sort of stuff and do the, maintain that quality control that you talked about and not, not completely silo them i think it's naive to think that the teams can't do it aside from the fact that we all have case studies where teams have done absolutely horrible jobs of it <laughs> so so yeah they, they're still yeah it, they still need us to sort of hold them and train them but um I would love to hear about the three P's who are from whoever said that. That that seems like an interesting. Uh, I would love to disagree with three too. P's. Well, we can disagree, John. Uh, I wrote the three P's. Um, well, I, I do think that for you know, the the next gen of current leaders, you know, as a leader, that they they have to start putting themselves in this roadmap of what's going to be coming down the line, where they want to go, where the team, where their team should go, how it is positioned with the rest of the company. So really if they, people want to start walking on that path of, of leadership, it's a long windy road <laughs> and, and you're there for, for the long game. So I think that, that kind of thinking uh, is going to be really important for them. Uh, because it's going to be, you know, also developing the muscle from politics. And, you know, I could have put like building relationships and partnership, which is all part of that. But I do want to, you know, boost <laughs> these next gen leaders and say like, no, politics is a thing and it's going to be in any company, in any context. Um, and, uh, and it's okay, you know, it's part of us being humans, but being okay that that's going to happen and it's not uh, you know something you know happening to them or anything like that but it's actually how to engage in a you know high level of collaboration with with these partners to build something greater uh, and and i do mean patience you know there are a bunch of soft skills that can be developed I think that that one is definitely you know, one inner strength that can go there. I've seen many brilliant junior researchers and they're like so eager to make their mark and to let's change things and make things better. And I, you know, 120% about their intellectual capabilities, but they have this urgency that must happen by tomorrow. And a whole company and development team is going to do a U-turn with them. And they are going to get in a car crash if they do that. So it's it's part of um, you know getting old. You get more patient, <laughs> achy body, but also more patient. And I think that it is going to help them to get more uh, again like secure in this long term vision for for themselves. So yeah, three P's. Peace. Yeah, Veronica, I think I think when I talk about developing strategic thinking, uh, mm -hmm. I, I agree with you. And I think it's the ability to be strategic about the opportunities, to know enough about the business, to see where the opportunities for impact are. But you have to be able to watch, you have to be able to listen, and you have to be able to find the opportunities and be able to um, provide a solution for that. And I think you, I agree with the patience piece of it. Um, but I think that that really understanding strategy and understanding the business is one of the things that we really need to teach our our upcoming um, leaders because you know it, it's not it's not just the application of really good research alone that makes that impact so you know I think teaching strategy it, it, enabling them to sit at a table where they can try out you know they it's safe for them to try different strategies Maybe they maybe they're right. Maybe they're not. You know, you, you have to learn by trying and giving them a safe space to learn and develop that, I think, is really important. So. I mean, that is one of the most amazing resources as a manager is having a project where it's where you can give it to someone. and It's OK if they fail. Or those are just amazing opportunities to find those sort of moments. I work with a lot of folks who are like just a few years behind me, but aren't quite ready to take that leap to the next level. Um, there's just certain things you can't teach, um, at least like didactically, right? Like patience, 
strategy. Um, you can try your best, but they just have to kind of, well, and sorry, this is very egocentric, I guess. Like that's just, that's the way I learned. But uh, it, at least in terms of the patient's part, it really has been, you got to just like give them good feedback and just like sit back and let them struggle and, and learn some lessons and try to like make sure that they've, you know, they've taken all the learning they can from it, not just like what failed or what went wrong or why the game sucked or not. But like, there is some of that, like you just got to put in the time to like, to, to get patient. And if you don't, you'll burn out, I guess. So that's, you know, that's the, that of it, but patience is a tough one. It really is. You wish, you know, you don't want to stifle their dreams when they're young and hungry and eager and all that sort of stuff either. So. We're, we're reaching the end now. This is about the, uh, the last bit, but, uh, you, know, you can make this as personal as you like or related to games user research, but what is the worst part? I mean, you know, my knees hurt all the time. The standing desk helped my back and then made my knees worse. And then when I sit down, my back hurts, my knees are better. Like, I don't I don't even know how to deal with this anymore. But uh, this is group therapy for old timers. So, so what do you got for me? What's the worst part? Oh, oh no! <laughs> Going, I'm gonna accidental word bubbles. Oh boy. <laughs> Boom! There we go. Fixed it. My eyesight is going. I feel it. My I've had shit eyesight my whole life. Oh well, you know what? If it's about the best parts, let's hear the best parts. I mean, that's not the question. But unmute yourself and let's talk about the dope stuff about getting old. Like, I mean, I'm the one who put them, I mean, it's it's good. I'm I'm glad I'm getting old, and I don't have to put up with a bunch of bullshit. I I, I don't have to prove myself. I, it's just, it's awesome. Somebody <laughs> just, asks you I, to go to a nightclub. You're like, no, I'm going to bed with a book. Leave me alone. <laughs> now, there's great parts of, of getting old. It just, it's no, I I like it actually. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Having new hires mention their older siblings used to give. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the the rough thing about being old in this particular industry, though, is it is such a young industry. It does feel at some point like you are the adult at the college party, and it feels a little creepy that like your st studio is sort of ninety five percent younger than you are. And there's a line about watching your old friends in the industry, but there's sort of more like, am I still supposed to be here? Is this, I, did I miss this, the signal? And, and there really is a razor that you balance on as you get older, because on some teams, like they, they see me as an older person and they're like, great, this person can come and help us resolve debates uh, decisively. But on the other hand, like ageism is a thing, like maybe we don't experience it as much as other, other disciplines, but I'm sure we do. But like a lot of my friends who are my age and older in the games industry are really suffering from ageism. Like they just can't get jobs anymore. And so I haven't had that yet, but um, but that's real. Like I know that I'm, I'm not, I'm 50. I don't know that I'll be able to work in games till I'm 60. Um, or maybe I'll have enough people who are my age and they're like, yeah, give old Jason a chance or whatever. But like really, you know, it is a pretty ageist interest industry. But I'm like Celia, I love getting old and being older here and letting new people bash their heads against problems and stuff and just supporting them a bit. Yeah, I'm I'm with you. Getting older in the games industry means now my kids can take advantage of all this stuff, you know, and they're like, oh, we have three Xboxes, so we can play an Overwatch uh, all day and all night. Uh, but the one thing I did put up in there in terms of in terms of career and even, you know, like I mentioned about possibly leaving games, there's so much fun stuff going on. But as you get more senior, most of those really aren't viable without a pay cut or taking a step down. Now, of course, you can go do it. But if you've got the mortgage and the kids, you know, so for certainly it's like, oh, yeah, that's awesome. And so I get a lot of jealousy, not because people are younger, but because they go get to work on cool stuff or go do a startup or don't care if it's a two hour commute or don't care if they have to work 30 hours a day. Um, and, you know, I've kind of lost some of that, but mostly it's around like, yes, I would go do that and spend my time doing that, but they're not going to pay me. And I could, you know, I have to be crazy to go do that. So that you can see some of those opportunities that you might want to go do, but it's, it's more life changing, you know, uh, at least for me, maybe other people are gutsier than I am.
that's it. That's the close. Thank you for taking us out, Tom. I hope, you know, this uh, old timers therapy session was as valuable for you as it was for me. Really, it's just me like desperately hoping for human contact and just hanging out with my friends and, and people that I dearly miss. And I hope to see you all at Games UR next year, wherever it may be. Um, but this was a lot of fun for me. And I, I thank you all for, for taking part, uh, for giving your feedback and for hopefully, you know, um, shedding some light on how we think about our careers, how we think about making games, how we think about running research and, and, uh, and working on all that. It was so lovely to see everyone. Have Thank, you, Johnny. Thanks, Thank Johnny. you, Johnny. Thanks, Johnny. Thank you, Johnny. Thank you, Prentice. Miss you all. Take care, folks. Bye. Be safe.